In 1991, frustrated by Hollywood, George decided to go back to writing novels when no one could interfere with his creative vision. And I started actually writing a science fiction novel that had been an idea I'd been playing with a long time, a book called Avalon. And I was working on Avalon, and it was coming pretty well. Um, and suddenly, the first chapter of Game of Thrones came to me, where they find the dire wolf pups. It's a freak. It's a dire wolf. Well, I knew it wasn't part of the science fiction novel I was writing. This was clearly a fantasy, medieval, had these wolves in this large family. I'd been reading a lot of historical fiction and it might have been in the back of my mind, but suddenly it all gelled and I, I wrote in I wrote that chapter in like two, three days. It just came to pour out of me. Don't stop. There are five pups. One for each of the Stark children. The dire wolf is a sigil of your house. They were meant to have them. You'll train them yourselves. You'll feed them yourselves, and if they die, you'll bury them yourselves. When I did return to books, I said to myself, okay, uh, I've, I've had many things optioned, they never make them. I've done pilots and TV shows, tried to keep them within budget and producible, they never make that. I'm tired of playing that game. I'm gonna, you know, I have a big imagination, I have an epic story I want to tell. I'm gonna make it as big as my imagination, I'm gonna have all the, the castles and battles I want, I'm gonna have hundreds of characters, because the real world is complex, I want my fictional world to be complex too, not a kind of simplified thing. I want to have giant battles, I want to have incredible castles that each one is distinct from the other that people remember for all time. I want to have dragons and dire wolves and mammoths and a wall of ice that's 700 feet tall. I want something huge and epic that can stand up there with Tolkien. In 1991, disillusioned with Hollywood, George R. R. Martin embarked on a series of epic fantasy novels called A Song of Ice and Fire, which has now reached book five of a projected seven volumes. Loosely based on the Wars of the Roses, it chronicles a bloody civil war in which rival families are fighting for the Iron Throne of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. Martin's ambition was to create a fantasy world as rich as Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. When you look at something like Lord of the Rings, you're, you, you are immensely impressed by the, the depth of the world building. And encountering all those appendices at the end of Return of the King, and you, you see how much material he has put into it. A lot of fantasy takes its lead from, from Tolkien, who himself was, was drawing from older medieval myths and, and tradition. But most of the people who follow Tolkien, including me, were faking it. I mean, Tolkien was the proverbial iceberg where, you know, nine-tenths of the structure is below the water. I mean, my iceberg when I started out was some ice piled on a raft. So it gave the illusion of being iceberg, but there was nothing below the surface. From the first germ of an idea, George had to build an enormous parallel world complete with fictional histories, religions, and languages. As you write the books, as you tell the stories, you need to start creating things, you know. So I'm, I'm writing those that first Game of Thrones thing, and you know I'm like 50 pages into it. I say, well, I, I better, I better have a map, you know. I'm, where's the king coming from? What's the name of the city? And what are, I, how far has he come? And I better design a map. And then at a certain point, we're referring to the Targaryens. I said, I better. How many Targaryens were there? I better. So I'm, so I'm not contradicting myself, I better make up a list of kings, you know, then I started making up names and numbers at first. That's all it was. It was just Aegon the first, uh, you know, one to 37 or whatever, and then his son, and then the next son, and a list of names and numbers. You add a detail here, you add a detail there, and, and uh, suddenly the world is growing uh, right alongside of your story. The world of Westeros, on one level, is a kind of alternate England in the Wars of the Roses. The map looks kind of similar to, uh, to England. Um, the politics uh, is reminiscent of the 15th century, 
the fairly obvious starting point is Stark and Lannister, York and Lancaster. But once you start to unpick the story, you see that there's history from I mean, just about everywhere. Uh, Roman history, history of the Crusades. You, know, you look up at, at the wall in the north, I think that's pretty obviously a version of Hadrian's Wall. Um, you could look at uh, Daenerys across the sea and you could see her as a kind of Cleopatra or an Amazon warrior. You've got uh, visions of Greek history, you've got visions of uh, South American history, ancient history, uh, modern history, all of this piled into the same world, they're kind of given a stir, and then on top of that, you've got this fantasy element as well. And all of this combines to create a sort of historical fantasy alternative world, but that is very, very much of its own. I always loved history, and European history more than American history for some reason. American history was fine, you know, Civil War, World War II, Revolution, all that stuff. But there, there was something that made me more attached to the Kings of England and the Hundred Years' War and the Crusades. I mean, that, that uh, evoked my imagination. For some of his leading characters, George borrowed attributes from the real kings and queens of England. Edward I uh, considered one of the great kings of England, but, you know, the more you read about him, you know, the Hammer of the Scots, Longshanks, you know, the Conqueror of Wales, this is a brutal, savage man. Edward II considered a horrible king, probably the worst in English history. He liked to hang out with the common people. He didn't like jousting and swordplay. What he liked, he liked carpentry and he, he, roofing, thatching roofs. That was his hobby. And he, he hung out with carpenters and, and masons and liked to learn about their building techniques. We would consider a guy like that a pretty cool guy, but it was just unthinkable at, at those times. There are times I'd like to be the king of the world because I could, you know, do a few things. But uh, most of the time, I'm glad I'm not because, boy, that's a tough job. And being the king of anywhere is a tough job, and I like to get at that and make the readers think about it. So long as I am your king, treason shall never go unpunished. Sir Illyn, bring me his head. When you look at a character like Joffrey, you see uh, a caricature of the dreadful uh, child king, but in a very specific sense, what I see is a lot of Richard II the king who saw off the Peasants' Revolt, but really a vicious, horrible, power-crazed young man who, who turned out very, very badly indeed. What constitutes a good king? You know, to what extent do you... Do you want to be harsh with your people? To what extent do you want to be merciful? Uh, where does justice come into it? You know, Machiavelli had his views, Hobbes had his views. I mean, this is a fascinating debate, and one that's as, uh, just as timely in 2015 as it is in 1315. I've got seven kingdoms to rule! One king, seven kingdoms! Do you think honor keeps them in line? Do you think it's honor that's keeping the peace? It's fear! Fear and blood! He's not writing his stories as a historian would write them. You are right down there on the ground experiencing them, looking out through people's eyes, walking there with them, and caring about them. And the moment you do that, you're lost, because you have to care. One of the things that sets George Martin's fantasy world apart from other writers is its moral complexity. You are no knight. You have forsaken every vow you ever took. So many vows. They make you swear and swear. Defend the king, obey the king, obey your father, protect the innocent, defend the weak. And what if your father despises the king? What if the king massacres the innocent? It's too much. No matter what you do, you're forsaking one vow or another. You know, it's a lot of fantasy that concerns itself with the battle of good and evil. And I think the battle of good and evil is a, is a terrific subject for fiction. But I don't think it's, it's fought between really good-looking guys in white cloaks on white horses and really ugly guys in black armor who smell bad, as in too much fantasy. I, I think it's fought within the individual human heart. I've always been attracted to gray characters. That's what I try to write, because I think those are real characters. Those are 
real human, real human beings. Game of Thrones is written entirely in a series of extremely tight third-person viewpoints. So I'm not using first person, but uh, I'm still focused. Each chapter has the name of an individual character, be it Tyrion, Arya, Ned, whoever it is. And during that chapter, you're, you're inside his head. You know, I, I never go omniscient, so you're only seeing the things that he sees. You're hearing the things he hears. If something is happening in the next room or even behind his back, he's not necessarily aware of them, so you're not aware of them as the reader, and you're hearing the thoughts of that character. One of the most intriguing characters George has created is Tyrion the Dwarf. He is disadvantaged. He is a dwarf. He is despised by his father and his sister. You are an ill-made, spiteful little creature full of envy, lust, and low cunning. He does have some advantages. He has a great family name, he has wealth, but um, he's also despised largely by the public. I wish I was the monster you think I am. I wish I had enough poison for the whole pack of you. Is this person a monster? Is this person a hero? Is, is this person a human being? They're both. I'm guilty of a far more monstrous crime. I'm guilty of being a dwarf. You are not on trial for being a dwarf. Oh, yes I am. I've been on trial for that my entire life. The golden boy, the character who can have everything and do everything and is, you know, the superhero, to my mind is less interesting. The golden boy of Westeros is Jamie Lannister. He's the guy who has it all. He comes from the most powerful family. He's the greatest swordsman in the land. He's incredibly handsome. How old are you, boy? Ten. Ten. The things I do for love. I think where the perception of Jamie really changes is suddenly when we're in Jamie's point of view. Now we're seeing the world as he sees it. We're hearing his thoughts, not just the words that he speaks, but uh, the things he doesn't say, the things he's reluctant to say, his feelings that he keeps hidden. When Jamie has his hand cut off, George manages to make us feel sympathy for this incestuous child murderer. Suddenly, in, in a stroke, he's, he's crippled, he's damaged, and we discover that there are reasons for some of the things he did and we discover his his doubts and his failings and his temptations and his justifications and all of that helps to helps to humanize him george has also created a number of complex female characters struggling to survive in a brutal male world it has also been criticized for portraying women as too subservient to men's desires well, women's options in the world of Westeros, and particularly the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros, are relatively limited, as they were, again, for for much of Western history. You know, Western history is very long. You know, women had one role in ancient Greece, and even there, it was different in Sparta than it was in Athens, and, you know, then the Macedonians had, were still different, and then the Romans came in and they had... So it's always changing. Um, and the Middle Ages itself is a thousand years long from, you know, the fall of Rome to the Renaissance. And during that thousand years, there were great differences according to country and according to time in the status accorded to women. Medicine was not far advanced. There were a tremendous amount of women who died in childbirth. Highborn women had, had more advantages, but in some ways also more disadvantages. They were more likely to be sold off for a political marriage and, you know, uh, oh good, I have a daughter, I can marry him, you know, my 12-year-old daughter to the 75-year-old guy in the next county and hopefully get his land. Middle Ages were not a kindly time for women. Now, that's not to say that it was true of all women. There were certainly powerful women and charismatic women, but nonetheless, it was, these, these were not egalitarian centuries. <laughs> the fate of George's characters and the moral choices they make has provoked huge online debate among George's readers. The fact that there are such vigorous debates going on there is it, an indication to me that I'm doing, doing something right. You know, when, when people are debating vigorously about whether a character is a good person or a bad person, that shows you create a real character because then they're debating about that person the same way 
we in real life debate about President Obama or Winston Churchill or Neville Chamberlain or, you know, real characters from history or from the current world. And, you know, if, if everybody thinks your character's a hero or everybody thinks your character's a villain, then you're writing cardboard. George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire was launched as a TV series Game of Thrones in 2011. It's currently the biggest and most expensive television series in the world. George likes to host free marathon screenings of the series at the cinema in Santa Fe, which he recently bought to save from closure. It's just good storytelling. It is. <laughs> it is everything horrible about humanity that we're not supposed to enjoy, but really is kind of enjoyable to watch. <laughs> it's a fantasy world that's true yeah. to life. What? It's really uh, true to the human spirit. He's sort of the dire wolf representative in the real world here. I think it's a wonderful political allegory. I think it's absolutely about the misuse of power. And uh, I also love it because I love Mr. Martin. He's been a great citizen here. He's given us a lot. I love old movie theaters. For me, that's part of the experience of, of going to a film. Um, I know the generation coming up likes to get Netflix and watch them on their cell phones, but for me, that's not the experience. I want to I see my movies on a big screen in a movie theater and uh, with a crowd around me uh, sitting in the dark and ideally with some buttered popcorn and, uh, and a soft drink. You know, I'm a big fan of television and film, but I, I never thought A Song of Ice and Fire could be done when I was starting it out, I, and that was almost deliberate. But when Peter Jackson adapted the Lord of the Rings trilogy for the big screen, he demonstrated that epic fantasy could be brought to life using modern cinematic techniques and digital wizardry. The films were a massive global hit. And Hollywood is basically imitative, so, you know, if a movie about a clown does well, everybody wants a movie about a clown. Epic fantasy had done well, suddenly every studio in Hollywood was looking for their own Lord of the Rings. George received a lot of offers to turn his books into a movie, but they all wanted to simplify the story. It took Peter Jackson three movies to make Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. He still had to cut things. It would take three movies for Long Storm of Swords alone. And if you figure like two movies for Game of Thrones and two movies for Clash of Kings, you're already, you're already up to seven movies and, and you're halfway through the series. Nobody's going to commit to that. And of course they wouldn't commit to that. The people I met with for movies said one of two things. They either said, oh, oh we'll, we'll just make the first movie and then after that's a hit, then we'll make more. Well, of course, if you go down that route, then you have Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials. Great fantasy. They made the first movie. Didn't do as well as they expected. You'll never see the second movie. You'll never see the third movie. So I didn't like the idea of that broken kind of series. Or alternatively, they said, well, we have to find, yes, it's true, it's too complex, it's too big the way it is, but we have to find the, uh, the, the central arc. And we've decided the central arc is Jon Snow. But the whole movie will be about Jon Snow. Or... The central arc is Daenerys. The whole movie will be about this exiled princess, and she gives birth to dragons, and that's, that's what your movie is about. Said, well, that, that might be a good movie. That would be interesting, but it wouldn't be my story. My story is a combination of stuff. And I was in a fortunate position because, you know, I'd worked in Hollywood. I didn't live an extravagant lifestyle. I'd saved my money. I'd paid off my debts. And now I had a best-selling series that was bringing in a lot of money. I didn't need the money. So I could had the power to say the sexiest word in Hollywood, no. No, thanks. Appreciate the offer, but no, nah, I don't, don't think we want to do it. But George's books found their way into the hands of two young producers who had something different in mind. I started reading and, and uh, uh, got to the scene where Bran is pushed out the window and thought, oh, I didn't, I didn't see that coming. And uh, got a few hundred pages more into it and uh, called Dan, um, who was an old friend, and we went to graduate school together, and I knew that he also grew up reading fantasy, and and said, I, I might be losing my mind, but I think this is the most fun I've had reading a book in, a, in, in as long as I can remember. He brought us back to that experience of compulsive reading that we had when we were, were kids, where you would sit in a comfortable chair for eight hours, read two, three hundred pages in a sitting by 
kind of grafting adult psychological reality onto a genre that was so formative for us. So it was a, it was a potent combination that he, that he pulled off so deftly and, you know, not just once, but again and again and again. Benioff and Weiss saw the potential to turn George's novels not into a film, but into a television series for the groundbreaking American cable channel, HBO. What he does with his genre is very similar to what HBO has been doing to the genres, uh, with the gangster genre, the Western, or the history, and, and the cop show. Like, it's what they've been doing for years. It's the shows that they made that have kind of ushered in the golden age of, of television. The books are full of sex, they're full of battles, they're full of violence, uh, none of which is ever going to get past the network censors. HBO was definitely the place to be. I mean, The Sopranos, Deadwood, Rome, you know, incredible shows, dark shows, powerful shows, shows with violence, social shows with sexua sexuality. They would get behind the project and they would give it a solid commitment. We'd never produced anything for television before. We'd never produced anything for film or internet or, or anything. We'd written before, but we'd never produced. So when we went to George, probably it was kind of like, it was probably like that bluff where you mistakenly think you have a straight and you actually don't. But we were so confident <laughs> that, that I think we convinced George that, well, these guys seem like they really know what they're doing. I said, I want it done. I want a faithful adaptation of the books. And they said, that's what we want to do. And we had just a great lunch. We talked for hours, the lunch turned into dinner. George tested Benioff and Weiss's knowledge of his books with an obscure question about the character of Jon Snow. And he got this sort of, you know, shrewd look on his face and he said, um, so who is Jon Snow's mother? And oddly, luckily, Dan and I had been talking about this the night before and we didn't know, but we had theory about it. So we kind of looked at each other and then one of us said uh, the answer that we thought. And he didn't say yes or no, but he got this little smile. And then, you know, the next we heard was George has approved your, you know, your bid or whatever you call it. So at the end of it, I said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. Go take it, go take it into HBO and run with it. Game of Thrones is now the most popular and the most expensive television series in the world. It has a cast of thousands and is filmed on location in Iceland, Spain, Malta, Croatia, and Northern Ireland. George R. R. Martin's vision has a global appeal. I don't know whether George is channeling the zeitgeist or George has changed the zeitgeist, but I think it's very true. He's a part of the reason the, book, the books and the series have become so popular. It obviously speaks to the way a lot of people feel. We've talked to people from Russia, people from Brazil, people certainly in, in uh, the States, and you hear, it's really, it's like Game of Thrones here. It's like the government is just like Game of Thrones, and I've heard that applied to uh, Putin, I've heard it applied to Assad in Syria, I've heard it applied to, you know, Republican politicians here, and it's just, uh, it's just everywhere. But there's a problem now. The TV series has caught up with the novels and George is nowhere near finishing the sixth volume. Luckily, we've had a lot of talks with George about where he's going. We know the end point, and we're hoping that, um, you know, that end point will be uh, very much in keeping with the spirit of the books. My very first... <laughs> Deadline on Game of Thrones, I blew fairly spectacularly, and I've been blowing every deadline I've been given ever since. There's always nine more things to do. There's always pressure to uh, write the next script or finish the next season or go on a promotional tour, and uh, it, it, uh, it keeps me busy. Fans of George's books have been getting increasingly impatient. Websites and blogs have appeared angrily demanding that he hurries up and completes the series. As early as 2009, his friend and fellow writer Neil Gaiman famously came to his defence. I told the world, George R. R. Martin is not your bitch. And it turned up, much to my surprise, on T-shirts, on badges. Somebody even wrote a George R. R. Martin is not your bitch song. George R. R. Martin is not your bitch. No. Your deal with that author when you buy his book is not that he will spend every waking moment of his life writing another book for you to read. Our deal with you is an implicit one, and it is that the book that you bought will be a good book. I've given up making predictions as to when I'm going to finish it, because every time I do, I'm wrong, and you know, then everybody gets all bent out of shape about it. I'm writing The Winds of Winter, which is book six in the series, 
and I hope the next to last book. Uh, the last book will be A Dream of Spring. Once those are done, then I can take a rest and enjoy a few of the accolades and the fruits of success that have accumulated to me and then go back to writing something or other. And I'll be a different person then and the world will have changed and I'll see what I feel like writing in whatever year that happens to be. I should be doing that right now. You're <laughs> interfering with me. <laughs> I'm sure this book will be a year late just because of you. <laughs>